I thought this might be a useful little one to do in terms of genetics. Um, we're talking about it today, actually, um, doing some revision. And it's something that's not really clear, not made clear at any point, and I, I think it might be an interesting way to look at things. It's this issue of, of dominant and recessive. Um, and it never really has explained how these things worked to you. So at GCSE you would get this idea that um, you know you have a, a dominant allele, whatever it may be, and you can have dominant form or recessive form. We say, well, the dominant one masks, it's a really useful word, I suppose to have it, it masks the effect of the recessive allele. It's never really explained beyond that. Um, you know, what's the actual mechanism here? How does that stop this one happening? Does it switch it off? Does it um, do, do all the chromosomes with this one on suddenly stop working? Um, it, it's never explained. So what really is happening is this. Um, it doesn't switch it off in any way. If you think back that a uh, an allele is responsible for making a protein, okay? By the way, I'll just throw in here as well, uh, this term polypeptide. Polypeptide really means um, you know, a, a string of amino acids. Um, so, so some things can be a short string of amino acids. It doesn't really make them a protein. Proteins are quite long strings of amino acids that are folded and have a specific job. To be honest, um, if you used polypeptide, um, it wouldn't matter too much. Um, a protein mean, tends to mean a complex polypeptide. Okay, just in case you come across other things. Anyway, uh, a gene is responsible for making a protein. So when we use the term dominant and recessive, what we really mean is the dominant one makes the protein in the way that we want it to work. And when I say want it to work, I mean it works for our bodies because it's possible for, um, if this goes wrong, if this gets a mutation, um, it's possible that the mutation can still work. Remember all that stuff on nonsense mutations, all that stuff. Uh, it's possible the mutation actually works better, which is you know what feeds into uh, things like natural selection. But for the moment, we'll just use this idea that the dominant one makes a protein that works in the right way, and the recessive one makes a protein that doesn't work. Okay, so let's imagine. Let's just make up an example. Perhaps this is something to do with pigments and our gene that we're looking at uh, makes an enzyme that converts one chemical, let's call it chemical um, P, and it converts into chemical Q. Okay. Now, if this enzyme is made properly, then P turns into Q. If there is a mutation in it, and it doesn't work, then P never turns into Q. So, I don't know, maybe chemical P um, is, a, is white or doesn't have any colour, and chemical Q is red. Just make that up. Okay, so if it doesn't work, we don't get the colour. Why won't it work? Well, if the res what we're calling a recessive allele is a mutation that doesn't, that, that protein isn't working. Maybe it's the wrong shape, maybe it's got a mutation that's cut the gene short so it stops too early and, and it's too short and all those, those kind of problems. So basically when we're saying dominant and recessive, we, dominant just means the protein is working as we, as it should do, and recessive one means it's not working. This also helps if we're thinking about co-dominance, because sometimes, um, what if the recessive allele works, uh, sorry, the, the recessive allele produces a, a protein that still works but in a slightly different way? Well, here then we can get this, this idea of co-dominance of two things going. We can't really call it recessive because it still works. So we, we get both effects put together. Now, to try and give you two specific examples of that, if I go back to the two things you did in um, GCSE, two conditions, genetic conditions you need to know about. So Huntington's disease, remember this was the one where um, the symptoms were forgetfulness, um, loss of balance, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's caused actually by the, the presence of a dominant allele. I'm going to put H, so that's for Huntington's, and the small H would be uh, for a, a healthy person. Okay. The reason that Huntington's is a dominant is a problem is that really is just representing a mutation of um, a gene that actually makes a protein called HTT. You don't need to remember this, but we'll say it anyway. Um, and HTT, it's not clear exactly what it does. It seems to interact with lots and lots of other proteins. But one of the, the mechanisms we think is, or scientists think, um, that when you get a, a, an incomplete version of this, rather than it doing nothing, what it does is it clumps together 
and it causes other problems in cells, particularly in brain neurons. So it just causes these, these big clumpy stuff. So here you've got a case of when it doesn't work, it just forms a big blob and, and causes cells to stop working. And then the, uh, the other one you have to know about was cystic fibrosis. And in cystic fibrosis, the it, it's a bit better understood the mechanism. So the gene itself um, is called the CFTR gene. If it works normally, um, as we want it to, it is responsible for making a protein. I don't know why I'm swapping all these colours today, but there we are. Um, it, it's a protein found in cell membranes. And it's basically an ion channel. And what it looks at, that's an ion channel. Um, what it does is it, it's uh, responsible for, for letting chlorine, uh, chloride ions in and out, more or less. That's, that's basically what it does. Okay, depending on which part of the body it's in, sometimes it, it, it does it one way, sometimes it does it the other. Anyway, the point is, in this case, if you get the mutation of this, and there are, there are several mutations you get, but basically stops this working because you get the wrong shape. So, you know, maybe the shape has gone wrong and it, it doesn't work as it should do, and we're not transporting these chloride ions around as we should. Now, the actual precise mechanism and what goes on here is, is not yet understood but whatever the reason is this misshapen um, protein causes a buildup of mucus in certain organs particularly the lungs um, and the uh, digestive system so in this case the the dominant one makes the correct version if you like and the recessive version makes the the wrong shape so it doesn't work Okay, so all we're saying by dominant and recessive here is, is, is we're talking about the protein working or not working. In the case of Huntington's, it turns out that the mutated version doesn't do nothing, it actually causes you more problems. Uh, and that's why Huntington's is caused by a dominant allele. Um, and I suppose this links back again. You know, what happens if we, we had a particular gene that made a particular protein and if the mutation actually improved on it? Well, we wouldn't be talking about it really being... Um, a problem then it, it's just something that we recognize is actually making an improvement in the organism uh, and making it better